Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming back for Marco De Renzi's second talk. Um, so yeah, please, Marco, take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for coming back. And uh, so yesterday I started uh, introducing, presenting uh, the algebraic setup I'm going to use for uh, this week. Let me uh, very quickly uh, review what I um, introduced uh, yesterday. So yesterday I told you what uh, ribbon category is, more or less, modulo uh, conditions I'm hiding. And uh, I also told you about my convention for a graphical representation of morphisms of a ribbon category. And um, this is maybe uh, one place, maybe the first place in this talk where we see um, some kind of uh, topological properties uh, giving rise to, for instance, algebraic uh, equations in this category. Uh, so there is uh, this correspondence between uh, topology and algebra here. And uh, I um, also told you what a modular category is in this uh, kind of uh, uh, cheap uh, definition. And I gave you uh, the main example. This will be a recurring example uh, for the whole week. Every time I will introduce some new abstract uh, notion, I will fall back on this example for a concrete uh, uh, for some concrete formulas. And um, I should probably mention that I'm telling everything for uh, UQ bar SL2, but there's nothing, nothing special uh, about this quantum group except that it's the simplest uh, example we can make. So uh, it's very quick to give you all the details. But in fact, uh, this kind of recipe for extracting a, a modular category from the representation theory of this quantum group also works for more general finite dimensional um, uh, ribbon Hopf algebras. Right, so um, then I mm, told you what a co end for uh, this special functor called the inner home functor, what a co end is. So this is kind of a, this is a magical object. Uh, that satisfies some uh, universal property. Uh, I told you a little bit about this property. And um, I recalled uh, um, a, re a result by Majid and Lubashenko that tells you that this very nice object uh, always exists um, when the category C is uh, modular, and that it also supports a uh, very rich structure of a uh, braided Hopf algebra. And in fact, this is maybe a second place where we see uh, interaction between topology and algebra. In fact, uh, uh, this braided Hopf algebra structure on the co-end is defined by considering certain uh, elementary diagrams and then invoking this kind of universal property satisfied by the co-end to uh, extract from these diagrams uh, structure morphisms for for uh, this uh, ribbon for this braided Hopf algebra structure on the coend. So um, this is a very nice construction of uh, Lubashenko, and I ended yesterday on this slide, giving uh, the concrete example for the coend of uh, the small uh, quantum group of SL two. In fact, uh, yesterday it was pointed out to me that my notation here was kind of confusing, so I changed it a little bit. But anyway, this is where I stopped yesterday by uh, introducing the co-adjoint representation for quantum SL2. Now today, I would like to uh, pick up from here and tell you about a third algebraic ingredient I will need for uh, my topological constructions. And this is an integral for the co-end. Now, the definition is the following. Uh, an integral of uh, L is a morphism of the category C that satisfies uh, these two uh, defining relations. So uh, the composition of the product for uh, the Hopf algebra structure on L with a lambda tensor identity has to be equal to lambda composed with um, the co-unit. And this has also to be equal to 
the product composed with the identity tensor lambda. So this is in fact the definition of a two-sided integral. So I'm just calling this an integral. And I should probably mention the fact that this definition uh, has uh, this precise form because we're in the unimodular case. So modular categories are in particular uh, so-called unimodular categories. And uh, more in general, uh, the integral for the coend uh, L is a morphism whose uh, source is uh, an invertible object called uh, the object of integrals. But in our nice case of uh, modular categories, this object of integrals is the tensor unit. So this is simple. And now uh, an important proposition of Lubashenko is uh, that there exists a unique integral uh, for the coend. And this is unique up to scalar. And uh, so this is some kind of um, analog with uh, uh, Swedler uh, result for uh, integrals for finite dimensional Hopf algebras um, in the category of vector spaces. So this is some kind of, this is a result of Lubashenko that ensures uh, the existence of this algebraic ingredient we also will need crucially for the construction. And uh, maybe an example. So in the case of small quantum SL2, we have a very explicit and simple formula for uh, the integral. So we take C to be, uh, as usual, U Q bar SL2 modules. We take the coend L to be the coadjoint representation. So as a vector space, this is the dual space of uh, the linear dual of U Q bar SL2. Now, this is a sort of a Poincare Birkhoff basis for uh, uh, U Q bar SL2. Uh, vectors in this basis are uh, E power A times F power B times K power C for every ABC between zero and R minus one. So, in fact, this is a R to the power three dimensional uh, vector space. R, I recall, is the, the order of the root of unity. And now uh, an integral uh, is a morphism from the trivial representation. So this is just the vector space C uh, with the action determined by the co-unit to the co-end. And so this is a co-adjoint representation. And uh, such a morphism, so this has to be an intertwiner. And, uh, but as a linear map, this is just determined by uh, the image of the, the vector one, the number one in, uh, in, in C. And so this is an element here. So it's a linear form on the small quantum group. Uh, this is called, I call this small lambda. And uh, this small lambda is, well, this is unique up to scalar as uh, follows by Libashenko. But um, the normalization I choose is this one. So lambda will send the basis vector E, A, F, B, K, C to zero almost all the time, except for when A equals R minus one, B equals R minus one, and C equals one. Okay, so there is a unique vector in this basis that's sent to one, and uh, uh, every, everyone else is sent to zero. So this is a very uh, simple, um, linear form. And uh, this is crucial for, for Lubashenko's construction. And in general, before him for, for Hemming's construction. Right, now, the, uh, the last ingredient I need uh, on, um, on, uh, in my algebraic setup is, uh, has been discussed uh, at, at length uh, uh, last week. So it's a modified trace. Um, let me recall the definition for people who didn't attend the last week's talks. So uh, a modified trace on the full subcategory of projective objects of C, so this is an ideal, a tensor ideal of C, uh, is a family of uh, linear maps whose sources are uh, endomorphisms of projective objects and whose targets are just the base field. And uh, this family is collectively denoted T. Um, 
and uh, it satisfies two uh, key properties. The first one is a so-called uh, cyclicity property, is something that everything that's called a trace uh, should uh, reasonably satisfy. So uh, if you take any two pair, any pair of uh, projective objects, P and Q, you take a morphism F from P to Q and the morphism G from Q to P. And you take uh, G composed with F, this gives you an endomorphism of P, its trace should be equal to the trace of the endomorphism of Q obtained as F composed with G. So composition in the reversed order. This is cyclicity. And the second uh, property is the so-called partial trace property. This essentially tells you that um, this modified trace should be compatible with the standard categorical trace in C. And so this has to do with the fact that projective objects uh, form a tensor ideal, so they are absorbent under a tensor product. So when you take a projective P and an arbitrary object X, their tensor product um, lands in, uh, in projectives. And uh, so every endomorphism F of P tensor X will have a trace, uh, a modified trace, right? And its modified trace should be equal to the modified trace of the endomorphism of P obtained by considering the partial trace along X, like uh, in this picture. Okay, so we saw this uh, last week, and uh, we also uh, saw, I think, this definition. I'm not sure, I think, yes. So uh, we say a modified trace on the ideal of projective objects is non-degenerate if this induced uh, pairing is non-degenerate for every projective P and arbitrary object X. So this pairing is defined as follows. You uh, take, it's a pairing between uh, morphism spaces uh, between the objects X and P. So if you take a morphism from X to P, G, and you compose it with a morphism from P to X, F, you get an endomorphism of P. What did I do? Uh, sorry. Um, you can compute its trace, and this will give you a scalar. Now, if this pairing is non-degenerate, we say the trace is non-degenerate. So essentially what we are saying when we uh, ask for non-degeneracy of a modified trace is that the trace should be uh, capable of detecting non-zero morphisms from or to any projective object, okay? Uh, so there should exist a morphism going the other way, whose trace, whose comp so such that the trace of the composition is non-zero. Right, and now there's this uh, crucial uh, result by Gier Kujau and Patiro. Uh, this was uh, mentioned uh, uh, last Thursday, was explained in detail actually. And um, this is actually a very um, specific uh, case of a much more general result, but let me state it for uh, in our setting. So when C is a modular category, then we know there exists a unique modified trace T on the ideal of projective objects. This is unique up to scalar and furthermore, it is also non-degenerate. So this is very nice. And the reference here is uh, the 2018 paper by these three guys. And uh, right, so let me also give you uh, the example for uh, quantum SL2. So let's take, as usual, C to be equal to U cube bar SL2 modules. We take the regular representation over U cube bar SL2. So this is, as a vector space, just the quantum group, and it acts on itself by uh, left multiplication, right? So this is a projective object because it's a free, uh, Mm, it's a free module, right? And uh, now every, so a basis for the space of endomorphisms of the regular representation is given by these uh, morphisms. So the morphism F, A, B, C, uh, that sends the vector one of U bar to the vector E, A, F, B, K, C, 
in the Poincaré Birkhoff width basis I introduced uh, before um, is uh, is a well defined. Uh, this def determines uniquely uh, an endomorphism of U bar simply because this is a well free uh, yeah module of rank one over UQ SL two bar, and uh, so it's uniquely determined by the image of one. Uh, so this is a basis for this endomorphism space. And uh, now the trace T on projectives, I will fix, so I will fix uh, a normalization because there is a unique one of the scalar. And uh, my choice will be uh, determined by this uh, definition. So over the projective object U bar, uh, the trace of this endomorphism is defined as delta between a r minus one so this is chronicle delta uh, times delta between b and r minus one and delta c zero so this is very similar to the integral and in fact the reason why this is the formula this is the formula which defines a trace has to do with uh, a result that was mentioned also last week by Belyakova, blanchet and gainudinov that tells you that essentially uh, integrals for um, a finite dimensional Hopf algebra are the same thing as uh, traces in some sense. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Modify traces on projective objects for the representation category. Right, so uh, let me give a summary of the algebraic ingredients I introduced. So in our uh, toolbox for uh, the construction of TQFTs, we need to put a uh, modular category C. Uh, we need uh, a co-end for uh, um, this modular category, this for, well, for the inner morphism functor of this modular category. Uh, this object, uh, we know it exists and has a very rich structure, no problem there because C is modular. Then we need an integral lambda, which also exists. Uh, this is a, morphism from one to L. And we also need the modified trace on the ideal of projective objects, which also exists thanks to Gear, Kujawa and Patero. Very good. So now I will move on to um, the second uh, part of my uh, talk, which, uh, in which I will try to explain how to use uh, these algebraic ingredients uh, for constructing topological invariants of uh, closed three manifolds. Right, and um, the idea, so the starting point for this is uh, the following remark. So for this construction, we will need um, to uh, use two different technologies. On one side, we have uh, Lubashenko's construction, which uh, builds on the properties of the co-end of integrals of the ribbon of the braided Hopf algebra structure the co-end supports. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, the technology provided by modified traces, right? And we need to make room for uh, the two technologies to coexist, right? And uh, there are uh, special topological gadgets called bichrome graphs, which are introduced uh, exactly for this purpose. So to, to uh, kind of support a graphical calculus that will implement both uh, Lyubashenko's construction and uh, uh, the theory of modified traces. So let me tell you what a bichrome graph is. So a bichrome graph is uh, a special kind of ribbon graph and uh, just to be clear, so a ribbon graph uh, is a notion that was introduced by, I think, by Rashetikin and Turayev. And you can read uh, in great detail about ribbon graphs in Turayev's book. And uh, you should think about ribbon graphs as the topological objects that lie behind the diagrammatic calculus uh, I uh, discussed yesterday for morphisms of uh, a ribbon category. So essentially a ribbon graph is uh, uh, an embedded graph uh, whose edges uh, carry an orientation, 
uh, a label by an object of the category of a ribbon category C, and also a framing. So uh, a framing is uh, an isotopy an isotopy class of uh, nowhere vanishing uh, normal vector fields, and this is there just to just in order to distinguish the the twist, so which is given by a small curl, from the uh, straight from the straight line from the identity, and uh, the idea is that when you look at the diagram, you have to interpret it as uh, so you have to interpret its edges as being framed, and the framing in uh, the convention I use for uh, for diagrams is just that the framing is always uh, directed. Uh, uh, perpendicularly to the screen and uh, going outwards and uh, so edges for ribbon graphs are like this and then you have two kinds of vertices you have uh, boundary vertices which specify like sources and targets for morphisms of the category C and uh, you have also internal vertices these have to be uh, represented by so-called coupons I talked about them yesterday. Uh, coupons are like uh, small boxes uh, with um, labeled by morphisms of the category. You have two specified bases and edges going, going inside the bottom base and out of the top base. Everything is explained uh, very in great detail uh, by, by Turai, for instance. But anyway, you should think about the diagrams we draw yesterday for. Uh, uh, for structural morphisms for a ribbon category. And now uh, a bichrome graph is a special kind of ribbon graph, which is equipped. Uh, so its edges are partitioned in two groups. We have on one side red edges, and these edges are uh, unlabeled. And uh, the other group of edges is blue edges. And blue edges are labeled as usual by objects of the category C. We also have uh, coupons uh, coming in two flavors. Uh, there are bichrome coupons uh, which can intersect both red edges and blue edges, and these are unlabeled. And there are uh, blue coupons which can exclusively meet uh, blue edges, and these are labeled as usual by morphisms of the category C. And uh, now a bichrome graph has to satisfy uh, two conditions, essentially. The first one is that bichrome coupons are in fact very rigid. They are all of this form. So, and by this form, I mean exactly this form. So they have to have exactly two incoming edges, uh, which have to be red. The left one has to be oriented downwards and the right one upwards. And they have to have a unique outgoing uh, edge, which is directed upward and is labeled by the coend. And you should think about this bichrome coupon as morally being labeled by uh, structural morphisms for the coin. I will be more, pre more precise uh, later on. And I should mention probably that in our paper, we consider also a second kind of uh, bichrome coupons, but to keep things uh, simple, since I will not use the second kind of coupons, mm, I will just uh, discuss this kind of coupons here. And now uh, the second condition is that boundary vertices are all blue. They all need to be blue. So uh, red edges cannot meet boundary uh, vertices. Okay. And here is an example. So this is a small example of a bichrome graph. Um, in this case, we have two kind of red components. One meets a uh, bichrome coupon and the other does not. And the blue part uh, features a simple uh, coupon like this. Uh, this has to be labeled by a morphism from U to V tensor W dual because of the orientations here. And this, we, we call this a bichrome graph from this sequence of oriented uh, labels. So negative orientation because this uh, arrow is going down with label V, comma, positive orientation with uh, uh, label U. And this, the target for this bicom graph is, um, is this object here, is this uh, uh, sequence. So uh, plus comma uh, the coend 
for the first uh, point, and the second boundary point is minus comma w. Right, so I will probably I should probably stop here, uh, and uh, and then uh, I will um, tell you some more. Yep. Yeah, so let's take a break. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I have a small question. Yes. Uh, Marco, you mentioned that, that there is a relation between the modified traces and the integrals of that of the co-end. Can you explain? Right. Um, again, I didn't quite catch this. Right, because I didn't explain it. <laughs> yes, so uh, in fact, there is a um, result by Biliakova, uh, Blanchet, and Gainuddinov, and you can check the references. And uh, this result tells you that uh, you can consider uh, the notion of a symmetrized integral. So in fact, this formula here defines uh, what is called a symmetrized integral. So it's, uh, you can read it as uh, some kind of um, linear form on the quantum group that sends this vector to this number. And uh, this is almost the integral I told you about before, but it's just that instead of having a one, we have a zero here. So this is why it's called symmetrized, because it's like, yes, it's symmetric in E and F and there is no power of K. And, uh, and uh, this is obtained essentially by, from, from, a, from a right integral by shifting uh, by K, or maybe it's inverse, and from a left integral by shifting uh, by shifting it either by k or k inverse, I should figure it out. But anyway, uh, this linear form on the quantum group um, is exactly the evaluation you get from a modified trace uh, when you uh, test it against uh, this uh, endomorphism of uh, the regular representation, right? So there is this theorem that tells you that if you have a symmetrized integral, uh, this will define for you uh, an ambidextrous trace on u bar, so you can extend it to the whole ideal of projective objects, and vice versa, if you have uh, an ambidextrous trace and you just look at what it does on the regular representation, you will get a symmetrized integral. And symmetrized integrals are just uh, obtained from uh, integrals by shifting using the pivotal elements, so they are a one-dimensional space, and so traces are a one-dimensional space. This is kind of the correspondence. Did you talk about the integrals of uh, the quantum group or the integral of the Lubachenko co-end? Because Lucas was asking about the integral of the Lubachenko co-end. Right, so I'm probably being a little sloppy here. So in fact, uh, um, with the conventions I chose, so I made a choice for the functor of which I considered a, a co-end, etc. Then uh, an integral in the sense of uh, Lyubashenko is exactly given by a right integral in the sense of, uh, so up to this correspondence, is exactly given by this uh, small lambda, which is a right integral for the uh, small quantum group. And uh, if you consider different conventions for the co-end, you could have obtained a, a left integral. So the fact that this is a right integral is not really important. Also because this is a right integral and this is a two-sided uh, integral. And the reason is because, well, the Hopf algebra structure on the co-end involves uh, some braiding uh, like this, which will make sure that what fails to give you a two-sided integral in the, for the quantum group will be a two-sided integral in, as, um, in the sense of a, of a Hopf algebra in the category C, so in the category of uh, representations. So this is some kind of, this is a subtle uh, point, but in fact, this is a two-sided uh, integral. This is a right integral and they correspond. And this has to do with the kind of a braided Hopf algebra structure on the co-end. 
while uh, while uh, UQSL2 is a hop algebra in vector spaces. So I don't use the, the term braided for, for this hop algebra structure here. Uh, just a quick other question if we have time. You stated sure. this um, theorem about the non-degeneracy of the modified trace on the projectives for the case of a modular category. Right. Uh, where is modular entering into proof? Uh, I think this is uh, I think this is non-degenerate. I might be wrong, but I think this is non-degenerate for uh, in the in the more general setting that was described uh, last week. Uh, so it should be in general a non-degenerate trace every time you consider. So it's even in a non-ribbon, non-unimodular uh, setting that you can define uh, an extended notion of trace. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you have to assume something like uh, an abelian category and probably a finite category, something like this, I'm sure has to hold. Well, I think has to hold. And, uh, but then you have an you, existence, uniqueness and non-degeneracy for this kind of uh, more general notion of trace, this alpha beta trace that was discussed last week in this much more general setting. So I'm not sure uh, modularity plays uh, a key role here. As that uh, was just writing uh, in the chat that you get uh, the non-degenerate trace from unimodularity already. Okay, right, right. Which so that's also yes. what I recall. And then if you just have pivot and finite tensor category, you have this, um, it's it's a twisted color B also, also non-degenerate, but in a, in a twisted way. Okay, 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 yes, yes, okay. So this is probably the way, the correct way of saying what I, uh, what I say the incorrectly. Okay, um, shall we start again then? I'm ready. Great, let's go, so let's do it. Okay, so, uh, right, so what I told you before, uh, essentially should tell you that, uh, should hint towards the fact that uh, bichrome graphs can be arranged uh, as morphisms of uh, a category uh, because I was discussing like uh, sources and targets for them. And in fact, there is a category of bichrome graphs whose objects are finite sequences of uh, uh, orientations and uh, labels given by um, objects of the category C. And uh, morphisms in this category are isotopy classes of bicom graphs with boundary vertices specified by source and target. Okay. And now the category of uh, ribbon graphs in the sense of Turayev uh, can be realized, can be included uh, in the category of bicom graphs, uh, just as the subcategory whose morphisms are exclusively blue graphs. Okay. So you can maybe consider this as some kind of uh, definition of, uh, well, not really, but anyway. Uh, so standard uh, ribbon graphs are embedded into uh, bichrome graphs. And now uh, Lyubashenko's uh, construction, which I will uh, explain uh, uh, just now, uh, can be reformulated as a functor uh, F lambda defined on the category uh, of uh, bichrome uh, graphs and taking values into the category C. And this functor fits into the commutative diagram uh, below here. So in this diagram, you have the category of ribbon graphs. You have Reshetik in Torev's functor FC. You have the inclusion as blue graphs within the category of bichrome, of bichrome graphs. And then you have this kind of a Lyubashenko Reshetik in Torev functor. Now, uh, a few comments. Uh, first of all, the category of bichrome graphs, I have denoted, uh, I have uh, used the notation which involves uh, the integral. Mm, so as I said before, the integral is unique up to scalar, and so we need to fix a normalization, which we suppose we did. But this category here does not depend on the normalization we fix. So the integral plays no role when we define this category. I merely uh, put uh, lambda in the notation to remind of the 
relevant functor that will be defined on this category. And this uh, lyubashenko rashetikin interrive functor will depend on the normalization uh, we chose for the integral. And then the second comment here is that uh, the rashetikin interrive functor, if you haven't seen it before, you can check this in uh, Torayev's book where it was introduced uh, in general. And uh, essentially what it does is it tells you how exactly to interpret uh, a ribbon graph as a morphism of the category C. And uh, if you consider a diagram for a ribbon graph like the ones we uh, introduced yesterday for morphisms of uh, category C, then this is exactly what the what the Rashtik Interav uh, does. It interprets that diagram as the corresponding morphism of the category C. So this is kind of the idea. So this is just to say that uh, Lyubashenko's uh, construction can be extended to a functor which restricts to the uh, usual Rashtik Interav functor on blue graphs. And now let me tell you an algorithm for the definition of uh, uh, this functor. Uh, and this algorithm will involve uh, several choices. So in fact, what I'm claiming here is that the result will be independent of every choice I will make in the process. So we start from a bichrome graph T. This bichrome graph has uh, uh, a source and a target represented here below. And uh, for convenience, I'm assuming that orientations are all positive for these boundary points but this is uh, not needed. Of course, you could uh, replace some plus by some minus and just uh, draw uh, the arrows, uh, so reverse the orientation of the corresponding uh, edge. And what we are doing in this uh, configuration here is that we are highlighting uh, all mm, red components of the graph. Uh, so in fact, uh, these, Components can intersect bichrome coupons, but you should consider bichrome coupons as part of uh, every component. And let's say that in general, this uh, bichrome graph T will have K components, and I arrange them up to isotopy like this. Then the next thing you do is you open each of the K red components uh, in such a way that you obtain a bottom graph T tilde. So a bottom graph is essentially this thing. So if you start from a red, uh, from a red boundary point, so this is not a bicon graph, okay? So if you start from a point here and you follow uh, the component through the bicon coupons and out of them again, you should end up here. And same for each of the red components. And remark that we made several choices uh, when we uh, consider this bottom graph T tilde, because we chose an isotopy that um, that was needed to bring uh, some kind, for instance, this arc of the red component near the left uh, bottom part of the graph. Then we cut it open, and uh, different isotopies. Uh, give rise to different uh, bottom graph presentations. So this is by no means unique. And we also chose an ordering. So these components are not ordered in general. So uh, you also need to make a choice about the ordering. Right, anyway, do uh, the choice you prefer and get a bottom graph like this. And by closing it up, you should uh, get back the original T. Now, the, th the third step, is to uh, label each of the red components using an object of the category C and just forget about the difference between red and blue. So now I'm turning everything black and uh, I get a morphism in the category C. In fact, I'm not only getting a morphism, I'm getting a family of morphisms uh, depending on the variable x1 up to xk and uh, by the way, when I, so I forgot to mention, but when I label a component using, for instance, X1, this might intersect uh, bichrome coupons, some, some place here. And you should label uh, bichrome coupons using uh, structure morphisms for the co-end corresponding to the object X1. In this case, 
for the object xk in this case and in general for uh, the corresponding object right so this is an honest uh, morphism of the category c and this is even uh, a family of morphism which is dinatural i claim in every comp in every variable and it's dinatural you can see this because if you place a coupon here with uh, with some morphism then you can slide it along the component past every bichrome coupon because bichrome coupons are colored by dinatural uh, morphisms so in fact every time you enter a bichrome coupon you come out on the other side with a jewel and you do this for all bichrome coupons and you will end up here with uh, the same morphism you had here but a dual but dualized and so this is in fact uh, dinatural in the variable xk and this holds for each of the variables so this is a uh, dinatural family in each of these variables and by uh, general properties of the cohen this determines a unique morphism i will denote it uh, fc of uh, t tilde so this depends on the bottom graph presentation and this is a morphism from the kth tensor power of the cohen tensored with all the objects you have here with target all the objects you have here tensored together right and this is just uh, something that exists and is unique because of the properties of the cohen and now we define f lambda of t as follows right so uh, you pre-compose this morphism you obtained with the integral tensor power k one for each copy of the cohen and you will find uh, in the end a morphism from v1 tensor vm to w1 tensor everything tensor uh, wm uh, sorry this should be an n so there's a mistake here okay right so this is uh, uh, the general recipe and i claim this is a definition this is a well defined uh, functor and uh, yesterday i was asked uh, how explicit is this because of course this is determined by a universal property this is uh, in general something we know it exists and it's unique but uh, we might uh, not be able to say much about it in general let me just say that in the case of uh, ribbon hop algebras so factorizable ribbon hop algebras uh, which uh, give uh, modular categories uh, corresponding to their categories of finite dimensional representations then this morphism is very explicit is very explicit is in fact uh, the morphism you get from um, and in fact also this morphism is the morphism you get from uh, Henning's uh, construction essentially and there are several places where you can read about uh, Henning's uh, algorithm. Um, I could tell you uh, several of them. I made a choice here. I gave you a reference uh, given by um, a paper by Habiro. And the reason I chose this one is that Habiro works with bottom graphs as we do in the oriented setting. While each of the other paper I had in, papers I had in mind either do not use bottom graphs or do not use orientations. So there are papers by Hennings himself, uh, Kaufman and Radford, by Otsuki, Kerler, Viralisier. You can read about this in several places, but Habiro probably is the closest to the conventions we have here. And this algorithm is very explicit. So you insert elements of the Hopf algebra around crossings and around cups and caps for this uh, diagram you collect them all and you evaluate the integral uh, against their product so you can read about details in this reference uh, habiro does not deal with the blue part of the graph if you want to see how the red part uh, is combined with the blue part you can read the you can check a paper by myself here in patiro where we do where we do this for factorizable Hopf algebras but unfortunately we do this for uh, string links instead of bottom graphs so anyway uh, there uh, every uh, paper has some slight uh, differences in their in their conventions but this was just to say that for hop algebras this is very explicit in fact and uh, instead of telling you in detail uh, uh, about the explicit form for hop algebras let me rather tell you uh, let me rather give you an example of a computation for 
the general setting of uh, modular categories I'm uh, describing uh, this week. So let's just consider a, a very simple bicron graph and let's see uh, what uh, this is associated to uh, by uh, the lubashenko reshetik interrive factor. So let's consider, for instance, this very simple T. This is a bicron graph from the empty sequence to uh, the sequence plus cohen, comma plus cohen. So this is right here. First thing we do is we open all red components, we have a single one because uh, in fact, uh, this is all a unique component once you go to uh, Bicron coupons. And you should open this like a bottom graph. So this is a very simple bottom graph presentation for the previous uh, graph. Then you should label each of the red components with an object of the category C. In this case, we have a single one. And you should forget about difference between red and blue. So you just get a morphism of the category. Even more, you get a dinatural family of morphisms. So by the universal property of the cohen, this will give you a, a morphism in the category from the cohen to this object here. So the tensor, the tensor square of the cohen. And it just so happens that the graph I chose um, is in fact, uh, uh, determines in fact, uh, the defining graph for the co-product on the coin. So I made uh, um, a simple choice and this will give you the co-product on the coin in this example. And now you should compute this, uh, the image of this uh, graph under this functor by pre-composing this morphism with a tensor power of uh, copies of the integral. In this case, there is only one. So this morphism is so, the initial bicron graph is sent to delta composed with the integral. Okay, so this is an example of a computation. Very good. Now, the idea is uh, I will tell you how to use this um, functor to define. So, how this functor, so the idea is that now this functor uh, makes room for the use of modified traces on the blue part. So the red part supports some kind of Lubashenko um, um, algorithm and uh, the blue part will support modified traces. So let me tell you how to define uh, an admissible uh, closed bicron graph uh, invariant. We start by saying what is an admissible closed bicron graph. So this requires some terminology. So if T is a bicron graph, we say it is closed when it has no boundary vertex. So when it is a morphism from the empty string to the empty string uh, in the category of uh, bicon graphs. And we say furthermore that T is admissible if it admits uh, some blue edge whose label is a projective object of the category C. So this is a very crucial uh, notion. Uh, not all bicon graphs uh, are admissible, right? Uh, this is the case only for uh, for um, non-empty graphs uh, in the case. So this is the case only for semi-simple C because when C is semi-simple, every guy is projective. But in general, uh, this is a non-trivial condition on, on bicron graphs. Now, if T is an admissible closed bicron graph and if P is a projective object, we say another graph, TP, which is an endomorphism of the object plus comma P in the category of bicron graphs, represented here like this. We say this TP is a cutting presentation of the graph T if the trace closure of TP is the original graph T. And the remark here is that just like bottom graph presentations for uh, bicron graphs, cutting presentations are by no means uh, unique. So, uh, you could have several uh, edges whose label is projective and you could choose to cut one or the other and uh, the two graphs you obtained uh, are different, are not equivalent. And furthermore, uh, you can change up to isotopy um, the way you open, uh, well, not up to isotopy, you can uh, open in several ways 
a bicrom graph and uh, obtain non-isotopic uh, cutting presentations for the same admissible closed bicrom graph. So this is not uh, something defined. So admissible closed bicrom graphs do not have a unique cutting presentation. But the theorem now is that if T is an admissible closed bicrom graph and TP is any cutting presentation of T, then uh, if you evaluate the Reshetikin, the libashenko reshetikin derived functor on the cutting presentation and you compute the trace of the endomorphism of P you obtained, this is a topological invariant of the closed uh, bicrom graph. And this is not a new idea. This is essentially why modified traces were introduced from a topological point of view in the first place. So in fact, this theorem is holds because of the defining properties of the modified trace, which guarantee the independence of this evaluation uh, of the choice uh, of a cutting presentation for uh, the bicrom graph T. Right, so this is the idea. And uh, now uh, I will, uh, in the last five minutes, try to tell you uh, how to use this um, invariant for admissible closed graphs uh, in order to define an invariant of uh, closed three manifolds. And the idea is uh, passing through surgery presentations. So if you never heard about surgery presentations, I guess uh, non-topologists might have never heard about surgery presentations. Let me just very quickly recall uh, what this uh, means. So there is a very standard, very classical operation, topological operation called surgery. And if you start from a three manifold M and you consider a framed link inside this manifold, so a link with, uh, with a non, nowhere vanishing tangent, uh, no, normal ve uh, vector field along uh, the link, then uh, this surgery operation uh, determines, so gives you another three manifold, uh, which we say it's obtained from M by surgery along L. And the idea is roughly the following. You should remove a tubular neighborhood of the link L and you should glue it back. So a tubular neighborhood is uh, a disjoint union of solid tori and you should glue them back in a different way, potentially. And how to glue them back is uniquely prescribed by the framing on the link. And in general, this manifold is a different one. It might change uh, the topology of the manifold. Now, there is a very classical theorem, and it's classical in the sense that it has a Wikipedia page, so you can click on this and go and read it. And uh, this is the licorice wallace theorem, and uh, it tells you that uh, every closed uh, connected three manifold M, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, Every manifold in my talk is oriented. So I will never, uh, I will always forget to mention orientation of manifolds, but this is an oriented manifold. So every closed connected three manifold M uh, is realized by surgery along some framed link inside the sphere S3. So there exists for every manifold M a framed link inside S3 uh, that uh, determines a surged manifold which is that which is diffeomorphic to M. And uh, this tells you uh, essentially that uh, thinking about framed links allows you to think about three manifolds. Only what happens is that uh, different links, so inequivalent links might might determine the same three manifold. And this is another very classical result. This is called Kirby calculus. And this result tells you that uh, two different frame links determine the same three manifold uh, under surgery if and only if these two frame links are related by a sequence of so-called Kirby moves and Kirby moves are represented here. So the first Kirby move uh, consists in either adding or removing to uh, a diagram of the link a uh, unknotted and uh, um, unlinked from the rest of the diagram component uh, with framing either plus one or minus one. 
And uh, this doesn't change the three manifold. And uh, the, the second curvy move is called uh, uh, slide. And uh, to perform it, you should consider one component of the link and an arc along another component. And if you slide this arc along the first component, and sliding means that you go parallel to the component according to the framing. So parallel here is a notion that's determined by the framing. And you come back here and you go back into the, the old component. Then this operation, which is called the slide, uh, will determine a diffeomorphic three manifold, right? So these are the two uh, operations. And uh, now, before giving you the definition of the three manifold invariant, I need to fix uh, some uh, uh, coefficients. So in fact, um, the two diagrams intervening uh, in the Kirby one move uh, have an associated scalar that's obtained by considering them to be red and uh, evaluating the lyubashenko rishetik interrail functor against them. This gives you a scalar. For the plus one framing, this scalar is delta plus. For the minus one is delta minus. And uh, it is a direct consequence of modularity that, um, in fact, both of these scalars are invertible uh, in the modular case. Right? So once we have these two so-called stabilization coefficients, and we know they are not uh, zero, so they are invertible, we need to fix, uh, to make a choice here for defining the invariant. And we fix a square root of the product delta plus times delta minus. We call this fixed choice curly D. This is an invertible scalar. And uh, linked to this uh, fixed coefficient, we consider another coefficient delta, uh, so small delta, which is defined as follows, either uh, curly D over capital delta minus or which is equivalent, capital delta plus over curly D, right? So we have these two coefficients. So this is just a technical uh, part, but now I can tell you uh, how to define the three manifold invariant. So the theorem is the following. Uh, you should first of all consider a closed connected three manifold M. You should consider an admissible closed bichrome graph embedded into M. And then you should consider a red surge representation of M. You should pick an orientation on each component of the link. So again here, several choices involved. Choice of the surge representation, choice of uh, an orientation on each component. And let's assume, let's give names. So let's assume that this uh, framed link L inside S3 uh, has small L, uh, so has number of components small L, and has signature sigma. So signature is an integer attached to a framed link. You can look for its definition in Turaev's book. This is kind of a very classical, uh, uh, anyway, uh, notion in, um, in topology. So this is the signature of a matrix that's uh, attached to the link. It's called the linking matrix. Uh, entries are given by linking numbers between components of the links of the link and on the diagonal you have the framing. Uh, and now the theorem tells you that uh, this quantity, so curly D to the power of minus one minus the number of components on the link times small delta to the power of minus the signature of the link times this scalar, which is the renormalized invariant of the union of the red uh, link L with the admissible graph T. So this union here is an admissible closed bicon graph. Then this quantity is a topological invariant of the pair MT. And I will stop here. I will just tell you that uh, this is what I meant when I, I don't remember if I told you about this or if I just wanted to tell you about this. But anyway, the defining property of um, the integral lambda uh, can be understood as being uh, some kind of um, uh, algebraic counterpart to the invariant under Kirby two moves 
of this functor f lambda and more generally of the uh, and also of the renormalized invariant f prime lambda okay and this follows directly from uh, the definition of the integral so the integral here is crucial i will stop here and starting from uh, thursday i will tell you about t of t's and mapping class, mapping class group representations Excellent, thank you. Let's, uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much, Renzo, uh, Marco. So do you have, um, does anyone have any questions for, for Marco? I had an earlier question in the chat um, that I wanted to ask Marco too. So um, this, so you start with this uh, ribbon category that is blue in, in your case, and then you proceed to these bichrome graphs. Should I think about this, this red stuff that you're adding as some kind of uh, an indeterminate, indeterminate object called red that you can then evaluate in various ways? Or is there, is there some other more intrinsic way of, of explaining this procedure of going to the bichrome stuff? You, I think you should uh, uh, think about the red part of a bichrome graph as uh, essentially being labeled by the co-end. The point is that, of course, uh, how to extract a, a morphism from the co-end to some object from uh, uh, the red part of a bichrome graph is not exactly done by labeling the red components by the coin. In fact, you should, you, should, uh, you should think about this as being labeled by any object of the category. And uh, you have one choice for every component, every red component of the bicron graph. And you should think that this will determine uh, a dinatural uh, morphism in the way uh, I explained before. Uh, and dinatural morphisms determine uniquely uh, morphisms from the coend. So in this sense, you should think about the coend when you look at the red part, but it's not immediately by labeling the red part with the coend. It's more subtle. It's done through uh, the um, universal property of the coend. So in fact, if you labeled uh, the red part by the coend, uh, um, well, uh, here, for instance, you would get not a morphism from the kth tensor power, but rather from Cohen dual tensor Cohen to the power to the tensor power k. So this is a this is really something that's not immediately read through the Rechtikin Torai functor. This is something uh, that's extracted from the universal property of the Cohen. Thanks. Any more questions? Could you um, repeat the same construction instead of, of taking uh, pro the ideal of projective objects and modify trace on it instead of take, instead taking another ideal and, and, and modify trace? Yes, definitely, sure. Uh, this is a very good question. And in fact, there is no uh, restriction uh, imposed uh, by the construction that forces us to consider projective objects. I'm kind of giving uh, the construction just for the ideal of projectives because for the TGFT part, this will be, uh, maybe I should not claim necessary, but it's something we use crucially for the construction. So in fact, I don't know how to do this more in general for the TGFT part, but for um, the three manifold invariant part, you're absolutely right. So we could have uh, considered uh, a different notion of admissibility. We could have said uh, a bicron graph is admissible if it has uh, a label belonging to some ideal supporting a modified trace. And then instead of uh, using the trace on projectives, we would have had uh, to use the trace on uh, this uh, ideal we considered. And then we would have uh, uh, derived 
a three manifold invariant, so um, an invariant for three manifold decorated with admissible graphs in this uh, more general uh, sense of the term. Yes. And so uh, this manifold invariant is, it must be not just a manifold. Manifold invariant, but manifold uh, with something in it, with a ribbon right. graph, and this ribbon exactly. graph must have, in this case, a projective object. Um, so, is there a topological interpretation why this uh, this projective object must float in the manifold for it to have this invariant? Well, uh, I'm not sure what I have in mind is a topological interpretation. But essentially, the idea is that you can define an invariant for three manifolds which are not equipped with uh, admissible bicron graphs. And this invariant is the Lubashenko invariant. So if you want to start from the, this modular category. Now, the point is that this Lubashenko invariant uh, vanishes too much for TKFT purposes. Um, I maybe should have mentioned yesterday that there exist uh, uh, weaker notions of TKFTs that have, become, have been constructed by Lubashenko and Kerler from the Lubashenko invariant, but these are not monoidal in the sense I, I, I told you at the beginning of yesterday's talk, so in the sense of Atiyah, with this joint union as a, as a tensor product. So, uh, in fact, these invariants vanish too much if you want to do TKFTs with disjoint union. And uh, now, the way, uh, one way to, uh, to find something which is not so vanishing, which is not degenerate, and uh, 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 you can construct a TKFT uh, from, is to use these modified traces, which are very nice and, uh, and uh, non-degenerate in a large uh, number of examples. And, uh, this is so not a topological interpretation so i'm probably giving a, an answer which is too long <laughs> because uh, uh, this is not an answer to your question but i think uh, if you want to use uh, modified traces you should have a projective object somewhere and my way of thinking about these decorations anyway uh, is only topological when uh, when you f when you i don't know when you fix a choice of a color on um, for instance on a link then the the, the color is fixed uh, and you consider all links then this becomes something topological which depends on the color but in general these graphs carry both topology and algebra and uh, yes uh, like uh, representation theory if you think about uh, concrete examples or just cate category theory if you think about uh, general modular categories so it's not a purely topological setting, if you want. So it's topology decorated with uh, some algebra. Anybody, any other questions for our speaker? All right, then in that case, uh, let's thank um, Marco one more time. And then um, we'll see you next time for the third talk. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, I've stopped the recording.